friends and welcome to worship. We are so excited to gather on this first Sunday of Advent. As you know, in churches, Advent become a big and busy season. And even though we are not gathering in the way that we normally would, we still have so much going on. I would invite you to take a moment and go to our Advent at a Glance webpage, which you can find at arvadaumc.org slash Advent 2020. You also should be receiving one of these in the mail just to give you some ideas of the opportunities and ministries and missions that we have going Going on in this season. We're so excited to approach all of this season with the full and wonderful community of AUMC, even when we're not close together. Today is the beginning of our adult Advent classes. We, they are starting this morning at 9 a.m. There are four classes available. Reverend Amy is teaching one on Faithful. We have one on It's a Wonderful Life with Reverend Linda Marshall. We're doing one on current events and our faith with Bobby Miller. And we have Bi Biblical Kaleidoscope, which is an in-depth Bible study being led by Marsha Clark. We'd love for you to join us. If you would like to be part of one of those classes, all the Zoom information is available on our website. You can also contact me and let me know if you need any help getting in. Reverend Amy and Tim Kennedy are teaching our class on Faithful again on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. So you can join that class as well. Joseph, we are guide and pattern, faithful to your sacred trust, strong protector of the mother and the infant Jesus Christ.
We do have lots of Christmas missions that are going on during this Advent season, and we want to give you a chance to give back as it's such an important part of our faith. We will be doing an alternative gift market, as many of you have participated in in our center in years past. You can do that online this year. You can purchase important gifts that help needed communities around our world, and yet still get a certificate to hand to your friend or family member who you're shopping for. We also are collecting slippers for the Dolores Project. It will help those experiencing homelessness over this cold winter. So if you have a chance to grab a pair of slippers while you're already out shopping this Christmas season or grab a pair online while you're doing some online clicking, go ahead and run by the church with those and you can drop them at the front door. There'll be a basket available where you can leave them. We do have a lot coming up. Please take a moment to glance through our Advent at a Glance, our Advent outreach, and our Advent education opportunities so that you can be a part of all of these wonderful ministries that are going on right now. Let us move into a space of worship as we continue to gather together in God's love. Good news, it's Advent, the season in the church when we wait and prepare for the coming of the Lord. Oh my gosh, Advent always comes at the right time and especially this year, it's coming at the right time for our weary souls to be reminded again that God visits us, that God resides with us, that God comes to save us in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Welcome to Arvada United Methodist Church here in Arvada, Colorado. My name is Amy Gerhardt and I'm the lead pastor here at the church and I join the entire congregation in the places and the ways that we're worshiping in this season as we especially welcome our visitors and guests who are with us today. It is an amazing time in the life of the church and even though we are doing church very differently in these COVID days, we still persist in telling the story and sharing the good news of Christ coming among us. And as is our tradition in the life of our church, every time we worship, we light a candle, in this case two candles, and typically our acolytes bring these candles into the life of our worship space every Sunday morning. And it's a way that we remember that the light of Christ burns within us and gathers us into this time of sacred space. You might want to light a candle in your place of worship this morning or throughout this week to remember that the light of Christ binds us together as we wait on the goodness of the Lord to come. And as we find ourselves in this Advent season among the unlikely faithful and follow the story of Joseph this Advent who travels with Mary into unknown experiences and unknown times to understand how God reveals God's goodness and grace to us in Jesus Christ. We welcome you to worship.
a time for the human heart to wait while trusting God's eternal time. How long, O oh Lord, how long? For those waiting for answered prayers. Grant your steadfast patience for those waiting in the face of uncertainty. Grant unshakable confidence in your sovereign provision. For those waiting for justice and mercy to reign. Grant a glimpse of your glory in our wounded world. For all of us waiting for God's kingdom to come. Grant that we might have the peace of Christ as we wait, the love of Christ as we act, and the grace of Christ as we speak. This morning, we light the first candle, which reminds us that throughout history, God's people have spent time waiting, wandering, and wondering about the time of God's eternal plan. Like the people of old, we long for God's presence to illuminate the areas of life where we are called to wait. This morning, we echo the words of the psalmist. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Psalm 27, 14. waiting people is to be a praying people and a serving people, a people who wait on God's promises in experiences and times of quiet and solitude, and to wait on God's promises by being that promise of God to other people as we reach out in concern and service to the world this Advent. I invite us to be in a spirit and in a time of quiet quieting down our minds from all that's filling them right now, quieting down our hearts to receive the voice and the Spirit of God talking to us, quieting down the world and the space around us as much as we can to find ourselves ready and waiting on the work and on the voice and on the activity of God in our lives. Let us pray. God of all creation, we declare that you are the eternal one, the one on whom we wait, that one that's worth the wait, the one that will bring healing and reconciliation and hope into our lives and into our world. We confess to you, O oh Lord, that we easily grow impatient when your word to us is to wait. We hate waiting in lines. We hate waiting on our computers. We have a hard time waiting on the promises that you continue to show us and reveal to us in your prophet's words and in the stories of our faith that even lives on today. Ignite within us a new and everlasting hope. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who teaches us how to pray and live by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm Ken Simons. I will be given today's scripture lesson, which is Matthew 13, 54 through 56. He came to his hometown and began to teach the people in their synagogue so that they were astounded and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these deeds of power? Is this, is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all this? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The biblical narratives of Advent are so well known that when we approach this season in the church calendar, the familiarity can feel like wrapping up in one of those warm quilts that we've been talking about for the past few weeks. The characters of Mary and Joseph, Elizabeth and Zachariah, John the Baptist and the many angels who share the good news in this sacred season hold special places in our faith journeys during this time. In this year in which so much seems foreign to us, it is comforting to find ourselves in these scriptural stories that we know so very well. And yet, I believe, as is true every time we approach the scripture, it has something new to teach us, something for right now, for such a time as this. While we tell the stories of Advent in the midst of lights and tinsel and brightly wrapped packages, the stories of Mary and Joseph are not wrapped in such decadence. Rather, we have a young couple trying to figure out what life looks like in the midst of changes they did not expect. And yet they find their way through with their faith. They lead us by their example, even as unlikely as they are to be the core messengers of our Advent stories. They remind us of the ways that we too are the unlikely faithful, leading others to the messages of God's love and Jesus' teachings, even in the midst of a world that might be missing some of the amazing acts of love and kindness that take place each and every day around us. Will you pray with me? God, who brings us so much hope, as we enter into this time of Advent, walk with us on this journey and remind us of your love's presence in and around us, even when things feel off. May we be graced by your love through these scripture stories that we too would grow to understand ourselves as the faithful doing your work in this world. Amen. Our time in worship this Advent will be framed by the book Faithful, Christmas Through the Eyes of Joseph by Reverend Adam Hamilton. It's an interesting place to start our Advent journey as the reality is there's very little said about Joseph in our scriptures. Many of the narratives we tell about him do not come from the Gospels or the New Testament, but from later writings that came in the 5th, 6th, and even 7th centuries. Joseph's story is often conflated with church lore 
and there is a desire to know more about not just Joseph, but also Mary and Jesus' childhood. And so people tended to make up new stories. We do find mention of Joseph in Matthew and in Luke, but he's completely absent from the Gospel of, of Mark. As Christianity developed and grew in the years following the early Christians, the desire for more details about Jesus' early life and his parents led to these stories being created, folklore being developed, and whole church doctrine being crafted around these myths. This is not completely unlike the development of our scriptural canon. Canon is just a fancy word for the books in the Bible. But with hundreds and hundreds of years passing since the time of Jesus' life, the church never fully codified these Joseph myths into the canon. While it rarely is prevalent in Protestant circles, the most common Joseph myth was that he was an elderly widower at the time that he was betrothed to Mary. The story, which is originally found in the infancy gospel of James, a non-canonical gospel which is not frequently encountered, claims that Mary was raised by the priests of the temple and until she was about 12 years old, at which point in time they sought a husband for her from the older widowers in the community who were all part of the house of David. The story implies that this would not be a traditional marriage, but rather the chosen groom would care for Mary as a father might care for his daughter. Each widower was given a rod or a stick, and Joseph was in this group of widows. When he took his rod, a dove sprang forth, telling the priests that this was who God had chosen. And so Jer Joseph took Mary as his betrothed. But the reality is that if we look at our scripture texts, we hear none of this fanciful tale. The gospel writers found in the canon do not give us any details about this type of miraculous choice of Joseph or him being old. And yet, as Reverend Hamilton points to in his book, the gospel writers also do not give us any details of Joseph's life. When I think of Joseph, I do not think of this elderly man. Rather, I imagine the story is much more commonplace. Joseph is a young man, like Mary, and is trying to figure out the expectations of society, family, and more as he begins this journey. Their betrothal and her subsequent pregnancy are full of the parts of nuance of life that fill all of our journeys. It is in the commonality of Joseph and Mary's story that we are able to find the surprising nature of their unlikely faithfulness. Their willingness to walk with God on this unexpected journey is what reminds all of us that there is not a special few who are called, but rather with God there are no boundaries. Each and every one of us is called, sent, and beloved. We do not need a rod that bursts forth with a dove, and neither did Joseph. His simple life as a carpenter and his faith that God would be with him even in the midst of the unexpected was all that God asked. Our scripture from today comes from later in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus is already in the midst of his adult ministry and he's preaching and teaching in his hometown of Nazareth, a town where people would have known his parents and his siblings he, they would have known his family and his family name. And they would have even had stories about them as part of the hometown that they were in, just like we have stories of people who grew up in our hometown. There are people listening to Jesus' teachings who are not happy with what he is saying. And they use his parentage as a way to discredit his message. 
They, even, they don't even name Joseph, but they say, isn't that the carpenter's son? They name Mary as Jesus' mother, and they talk about his siblings, and they give the impression that Jesus' family still lives in the area. They know his sisters, but they use this mention of Joseph's profession as a carpenter to discount what Jesus is saying. Unlike if Jesus' parents had held places of great stature in the community, the scripture seems to imply that rather Mary and Joseph were just as they seemed in the stories of the Gospels. They were the unlikely faithful, common people living their lives, and God uses their faith to spread messages of love and hope for generations. As this pandemic has drug on far longer than most of us anticipated, we have been inundated with stories of just how divided we are. Basic safety precautions have become partisan fodder. The election thrown in on top of the constant strain and stress of COVID has elevated the anxiety in our country and created what feels like a never ending news cycle of bad news that is only getting worse. And yet we know in the lives of ordinary people, the random acts of kindness that have filled this time and brought much needed love to people experiencing great hardship has been so important. Right here in AUMC, we have people who have made phone calls to others for 36 weeks. That's the length of a full school year. There have been meals offered when friends are sick and Zoom calls when families lost loved ones, cookies and treats shared when birthday parties just weren't an option. We know that the stories of those who work on the front lines in our medical professionals have offered this same sense of kindness, compassion, and hope for people even in situations that have seemed hopeless. And our teachers, our teachers have stepped up and stepped out to care for those students who they cannot see and be with every day. Jessica Matthews is a teacher in Flint, Michigan. She, along with other educators from around the country, were interviewed by Time Magazine as this school year began. Her school started off the year in remote learning, as so many schools did and are returning to right now. Jessica says, as the school year started, I knew that care needed to come before content. I needed to care more than care about what they were learning. Everyone in education knows that lack of technology is a problem. The number of students who just don't have any tool to allow them to do at-home learning is tremendous. And she said, we're already leaving them behind. And so she answers texts from students long into the night, helping them with English and algebra and broken computers and losing family members and friends to COVID and more. She's dropped textbooks at doorsteps and made calls to make sure that her students were cared for and still able to learn in the midst of all of this. And Ms. Matthew's perspective is that safety and care are supposed to be at the forefront all the time in our education system. So she considers all of this to be part of her work. Jessica Matthews, along with most of our educators, are not being lifted up by society for the incredible work they are doing in the midst of this pandemic, or the fact that this is the work they do, whether there's a pandemic or not. She's a fairly ordinary individual who works in a fairly commonplace job, and yet she is sharing hope and love and care for her students. Her compassion will help her students and their families in this tough time. She's an unlikely hero. 
Her actions remind all of us of the ways kindness and love can come from the small, basic acts. Our faith gives us stories of common, ordinary individuals like Joseph, who remind us that we are called to be the unlikely faithful, the ones who share in the acts of kindness, who spread love in our communities, and compassion to those who need it, who lift up the stories of those who are doing the same so that we can be reminded once and again of the incredible hope that fills our world, a hope that will lead us on this Advent journey. Amen. On this first Sunday of Advent, may you be reminded that we are all called, we are all loved and beloved, as we are the unlikely faithful in our world, spreading messages of compassion and hope for others to find God's love as well. Amen.